FBI agents call him the Batman of the Internet. He has hacked ISIS. He has, after the Charlie Hebdo murders, put up pictures of Muhammad. Let people know that we're not going to have our freedom of speech shut down. And he hacked into the global Islamic media front. He's been on the front cover of CNN. Uh, He has just been fresh off of hacking the Russian foreign ministry because uh, he has a belief that they have been uh, messing with our elections. His laptop is in the spy museum in Washington, D.C. And uh, he has tactics in mind. He doesn't do this blindly. When he goes out and hacks places like the Global Islamic Media Front, he's looking to shut down these little pages, little sites, to herd the the online uh, presence of ISIS into the bigger sites. Easier to look at and easier to control. We could not have the gesture on without having his very own walk-on music. He is a worldwide, world-famous, patriotic hacker. Jester, welcome to the Todd Herman Show. Thank you. So it took you all of about 20 seconds to get into the Russian Foreign Ministry's website. And by the way, why am I not surprised, given by who you are? And, and could you have done actual damage, like gaining access to data, if you'd chosen to do that? Yeah. So the the Russian thing was the equivalent of a uh, a cyber nipple tweak. There was a relatively minor vul- vulnerability on the site, which I exploited in order to leave a message. So no actual damage was done to their foreign military site, and nothing was taken. The attack was designed to ruffle their feathers, which it did, given the amount of screeching Russian media. Uh, Maria Zarkova did. It took them around <laughs> 72 hours to regroup fully, discover what had happened, and decide on the final version of events with added spin to push out to Russian media outlets. So it was never meant to be a physically damaging strike, just just a message politely asking them to stop meddling in our democratic process, really. And I think they got it. <laughs> okay. As it says in your blog, and we've linked to the Jester's blog on uh, the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Todd Herman Show, AM 770 KTTH. Like the page, you can see the blog and the other things. Now, you had an end game in mind for this hack, and it was to draw the Russian hackers out to get a handle on their tools, techniques, and procedures. And so they took the bait, and uh, I guess they've been trying to hack you. What have you been experiencing from that, and, and uh, what, have been, what have you been learning from them? Yeah, for the 24 hours immediately after the incident, my own website came under fire, but I was expecting retaliation, so I had all my ducks in order to capture all the malicious traffic. And in that 24 hours, I detected and intercepted some 13,000 wow. separate attacks, a significant portion of which was coming out of Russia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Russia is well-known as a place that openly hosts botnets for the purposes of overwhelming websites, a website's ability to serve up pages Mm -hmm. to legitimate visitors. So it was mostly that flavor of attack, basically trying to bring me offline rather than gain back-end access to anything. Now, my site is still up and fine. (laughs) Uh, I experienced a few minutes of downtime, but after temporarily redirecting my domain to Mossad's IP space instead of my own, that particular burst stopped and didn't come back. It's, I'm not. I'm not stunned. So, how active is Russia in attacking us digitally? And can you give some examples of that gesture? Aside from the army of Russian Twitter and Instagram bots that made up many of Trump supporters, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, WikiLeaks. I've done numerous posts going back more than three years on my blog about the connections between WikiLeaks and Russia. I'd say the majority of their most explosive leaks have either come from. Kremlin supporters inside our agencies or have been directly extracted by Russian hackers. For example, the DNC email breaches. The two big threats cyber-wise are China, who are focused on stealing U.S. intellectual property, and Russia, who are trying to undermine U.S. infrastructure and processes up to and including our very democracy. So Russia's weaponized cyber offensive goes by a few names, uh, including Cozy Bear, uh, APT29 and the Dukes. These are the guys responsible for the DNC email hacks. Okay, so uh, this is all fascinating to me. We're talking with the jester. Um, we've linked to his blog on the Facebook page, Facebook page, um, facebook.com forward slash Todd Herman Show, AM 770 KTTH. So is Snowden a Russian agent? And, and um, I mean, I, I guess, you know, it's connected to WikiLeaks a little bit, but is Snowden, uh, is he a Russian agent? Uh, to Russia, I'd say that Snowden is a... Useful idiot and a giant narcissist and actually common thief. WikiLeaks helped him after he approached them. And it was WikiLeaks who arranged for his safe haven at Hotel FSB in return for the less 
useful documents that he stole. I'm actually pretty convinced that Russia keeps the juicy stuff for themselves and WikiLeaks really gets the cast off, as we've seen in recent months. It's also worth noting that within hours of Trump being elected, a close Putin aide, Sergei Markov, admitted they may have helped WikiLeaks a little. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've spoken to an author on Russia, and um, he contends that Putin's goal is actually messing with uh, in messing with our election isn't to elect Trump or Hillary, uh, but to cause upset and distrust and confusion. And I guess you kind of seem to agree with that. Do you think Russia wants Trump in office? Yeah, I totally agree with that statement for sure. But I'm also of the opinion that the way the Trump aligned himself with Putin to the point of public admiration and refusing to believe intelligence briefings from people who know what's uh, detailing what their game is, along with the fact that Putin clearly sees Trump as very easily manip- manipulated. Of course, Putin prefers Trump in the White House. They're already signaling that they want renewed relations, which will start with the U.S. lifting sanctions and recognizing their invasion of Crimea for a start. For a start. I'm, I'm hoping the president-elect takes his new role more seriously and listens to advice from the people charged with advising him. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who are hoping that. I mean, mm-hmm. this is a fascinating, fascinating time. Um, I've, talked in, I've spoken on the show um, in, in some depth about some of the cybersecurity issues we've had in the country. And I did a kind of an extended segment on something that happened in New York. And most of my listeners know that in upstate New York, some foreign actors, and it was likely Iran, uh, were able to gain temporary limited operation, con- operational control over a dam on a river. Um, and that's that just might concern me a tiny little bit. Now, in your opinion, is Russia poised to undertake a meaningful, truly harmful cyber attack against us if they chose to do that? Yeah, previously, the threat from cyber has not been understood or addressed. I'm glad to say that that's all changing now. Major nation states have assembled their own versions of Cyber Command and the 24th Air Force, among others. Administrations around the world, including Russia, are realizing that the true nature of the cyber threatscape is to create a kinetic effect on real-world assets remotely and with no little or no inbound uh, attribution. All developed nations are developing their offensive cyber capabilities and countermeasures. It's It's basically the next evolution of the arms race that we've seen in the past. Yeah. And, and, you know, I read that piece and and found myself a little bit, you know, concerned because we live in an area with dams and and I don't want to see that happen here. Now, in your mind, and we're talking with Jester, um, you can follow him on. Well, yeah, I guess you can look at his tweets on Twitter. You can follow him. I'm going to link that as well. He's very, very active on Twitter. Um, Big press section. We've linked to that on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Todd Herman show. Uh, Probably the world's most famous patriotic hacker, um, God and country. So Jester, in your mind, um, given what you believe Russia or Russians are doing to us technically, uh, what would a proportional response look like from us? And that could we go turn off the lights in Red Square for a bit? Or you'd probably have better ideas. <laughs> well, we've already seen early yet still very sophisticated cyber attacks causing real world kinetic damage. Uh, take Stuxnet, for example. That was basically advanced malware that invaded antivirus solutions to infect many hundreds of thousands of computers. It could have been sitting dormant on your own laptop. It looked for two conditions before its payload was triggered, and all conditions had to be true. It checked to see, where am I physically? Am I inside Iran? And am I sitting on a a system running certain Siemens Scott industrial control software that is exclusively used inside centrifuges used in nuclear weapons production? So if these conditions, conditions were met, Stuxnet took over control of the centrifuges and then spun them up at destructive speeds, while at the same time, feeding false telemetry back to the scientists who were monitoring so they didn't catch on until the damage was done. And it was said that this pushed Iran's nuclear program back two years or more. And that's that's the first known example of targeted weaponized malware use against targetized weaponized malware use against a nation state to cause kinetic damage. Nobody knows who executed this operation, but it's speculated that it uh, it might have had something to do with Israel and <laughs> yeah. USA. And maybe something uh, to do with the song Thunder, Thunderstruck. You never know. Never know. Um, now, um, in, 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 this is uh, something that's been bugging me. Um, and I come from a tech background, nothing anywhere near your own. But um, some government agencies and politicians have been refusing legal FOIA requests and public document uh, disclosure demands. And all of these are legally binding. And they've done this to hide information from us. So like the, the VA. 
uh, has refused judges' orders to release to Congress their new performance reviews. And their performance reviews have been terrible, but they won't release them. So with that in mind, in, in your mind, Jester, will there ever be a time when so-called hacktivism to get what we the people actually own, like those reports, can, will there be a time um, when that is you know, uh, allowable or, or could be considered okay, or is that a line that we can't cross? Well, I don't know if you can really justify hacktivism across the board like that because it's it's so fragmented and pursuant to what the individual who's doing the hacking cares about. I'm sure all it would take is a hacker with a mindset to go and get that stuff and it'll show up somewhere. So if, if it's not a hacker, then a whistleblower or someone inside the VA willing to leak. And as we've seen in the past few weeks, there's people in all agencies willing to leak even inside the FBI. But Going back to the hacktivism angle, yes, if someone with the right skills and motivation and patience decided they wanted those reports, that someone would very likely get them. I'm not sure how the, how the law would look at it. I guess it would ultimately be theft, but theft of something that belongs to the people and then he gave it back to the people could be a legal precedence in the making. I don't know. It almost sounds like a job for the anonymous ass clowns if they could be treated, <laughs> trusted not to totally screw it up. But that might be asking a little bit too much. All right. Uh, last question uh, for the great jester. And I hope you'll go to the uh, the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Todd Herman Show, AM 770, KTTH. Read um, the jester's blog. Uh, and the, the press section is fascinating, just a fascinating career. I know there's going to be a movie one day, and we'll have to get to that one time. But last question for you. So on your blog, um, you have taunted Russia with a little game you put together um, that's a reminder of the movie uh, War Games. In fact, when I clicked on it, I got scared that it was going to do something to me. So the question is, given your incredible knowledge and skills in this uh, in this arena, what most concerns you about a cyber war, and, and what does America need to do to win such a thing? I'd like to see greater interagency cooperation, which has, in fairness, improved vastly since 9-11, but also partnerships with private companies who are in the business of threat analysis, mitigation, intelligence, and maybe even countermeasures, including offensive. There's, there's a lot of talent out there chomping at the bit, and we should really be embracing and developing that talent. Yeah. It's been a pleasure to have the great gesture. Is there anything else that you want to add to that? I, I definitely want to wish a happy Veterans Day and thank all the men and women for all their service and sacrifice. Couldn't be here without it. No. God and country, right, sir? Absolutely. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a radio first to the great gesture. Thank you for joining us on the My pleasure. Happy Veterans Day.